This is just an example. I was asked to show you some example landscapes. This is a California native plant. This is a very drought tolerant coral bells. This in areas where the water has broken or been off uh, for some reason. In the summer when it's not watered, it gets all crinkly and kind of doesn't look so good. And then when you start watering it again, it just starts to grow again. It grows back and it looks fine. This is a cultivar called Rosada. Um, and the local nursery guy over in Dixon starting to have it pretty dependably, which is nice. And then this is a forsythia. Who would have thought that a forsythia, if you're from back east, everybody from back east knows the yellow forsythia is in February, and it's amazingly drought tolerant. A lot of the other Mediterranean things, just because it's not on the, the Ulster list was really intended to give new um, gardeners and people that were just starting out some really dependable options for low water that wouldn't be tricky. I always like to tell people, if I didn't kill it, you can't either. And, um, but there's lots of other options. Uh, and so you could, if, if you really get into it, you can do, you can find other possibilities be besides the All-Stars. You just have to make sure they're gonna be compatible. And this is one of the All-Stars. This is the ground, the dwarf germander. And this was outside a winery over in uh, Napa. No, Sonoma. And I thought they did a really good job. It's just lavender with the dwarf germander. Yeah. That they're, eat, that they're One's not a medium and the other's not a very low. Because, like, I've been trying for a long time to grow this white sage in my front yard, and uh, that thing does not want to be watered in the summer. So if you have it next to an aster, there's something that you want to water every two weeks, it actually will kill the white sage. Why haven't California native plant gardens and native gardens been more popular up until now? I really think it's because of the plants, a lot of them are tend to go dormant in the summer, and that results in what I like to call what, okay, golden, not brown. One time when I first moved here from back east, I'm driving through the hills at Vacaville, and I said to somebody I was in the car with, I go, why are the hills all brown? You know, because I was from Connecticut. It was green all year round. And, and he looked over at me, he goes, they're not brown, they're golden. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the other, this is the main reason I like to mix like the grasses, the native grasses with rosemary. Rosemary is perfectly, very extremely drought tolerant and it, it'll always be evergreen when this goes golden. And then you can use that to create, by using the evergreen and the deciduous plants together, you can create these different tapestries. And also beware that there are many California native plants that do need a lot of water. The redwoods are a perfectly great example. And anything from over in the coastal zone that's native to the foggy areas usually is not gonna be drought tolerant. Like, and a good example of that is these woodwardia ferns, um, which grow over in the redwoods. And they are on the all-star list. They need a little bit of water more than, than many of the plants on there, but because it was a native fern and a lot of people do still have big uh, redwoods in their yard? Who has a big redwood in their yard? Yeah. And you're like, what the heck do you put under there? Well, these woodwardia ferns would be a good option. Um, about 50% of the arboretum is actually planted to native plants, you know, from a plan view looking down. And so we have lots of other things um, that you can go and see. And, and a lot of them just do happen to be native. This is a shrubby, very large, um, small tree type of Ceanothus, which is super garden tolerant. It can be watered or not watered and it still survives. It's really great. Western red buds are fantastic to use because they're native right here where we live. If you drive up into the foothills, you'll see them up there. There's been research on the native bee species. There's 15, 1,600 now native species of bees that are super important and that will pollinate crops in the absence of the honeybee. And this plant had like one of the highest ratings for the diversity of species that would utilize it. So you're not only getting a drought tolerant plant, you're getting a plant that actually contributes to the ecological balance of where you live. You know, they don't. We used to think they did, but we've been putting them in the sun just to see what would happen and they look pretty good. Mostly they, where they're really happy is under those giant oaks, the big valley oaks. And what they're getting there is what I call um, high shade. It's not a dark shade. It's really bright under there because there's angled light from the sides. 
but they are shaded, speckly shaded from over above. I have one in my front yard right by the driveway. I haven't watered it this year. Well, I watered it once because I felt sorry for it. Like, it must need some water. <laughs> so <laughs> I put the hose on it for a little while. <laughs> Toyon, uh, this is the uh, um, Christmas berry, or the, the, some people say Hollywood was named for this plant. It would be native in the hills up above Hollywood there. Um, a really great beneficial insect plant in, and for the, in the spring with white flowers that aren't showy, but what it's really great for is these berries at Christmas time. And uh, this is a funny story. This is the shrub right here. And I was out giving a tour one time and it shows you how tall it gets. So it's a big thing, but it is evergreen. You can use it in the, in the dry part of your yard in the back to screen your neighbors. Um, and I was leaning a tour in front of this one time and I was doing my thing going, and these are the preferred food of the migrating uh, waxwings, cedar waxwings. And then the bush behind me started moving, you know. I'm like, I turn around and I <laughs> lean over, I go like this, and I open up the shrub, and a whole flock of cedar waxwings flies over my head. And all the people on the tour go, whoa. <laughs> How'd you do that? I go, I didn't do it, it just happened, you know. Just, I got lucky. But anyway, they really do like those berries and can be used for decoration at Christmas and things like that too. How often, very low, what does that mean in watering? So that's, you're watering once a month, once it's fully established. I mean, and even then it might be okay if you have really good soil. See, this really depends on where you live because you guys are all from Davis. We pretty much all have clay or clay loam and, and things like that. By the way, this is a plant that does not like water in the winter. So if you have, get, get water that pools in the winter in your yard, you want to make a very slight elevation mound so that the, where the stem goes into the soil doesn't stand in standing water because it won't, won't tolerate that. It doesn't like it at all. Um, I'm sorry, would you ask me again? Where'd you go? Where did, she ask? did I answer the question? Yes, you did. Okay. This is the plant I've got that I've been realizing really does not like any water. If you water it, it gets little dead patches in it, um, but it's a beautiful white, really white, white, uh, fuzzy leaf and uh, gets pretty big if it's happy. And uh, when we have these at the sale, they, um, a lot of the Native Americans come and this is the one they all want. It has some kind of magic properties or something. And they said, if they told me if you put a leaf in your water bottle in the morning, you won't feel stress all day. I thought, I should try that. <laughs> that would be good for me. <laughs> I don't know anything about plants. So is this what they often call mule ear? No. This has a woody base. It's a large, it's a, it's a, a perennial that acts like a shrub. They call it a sub shrub where the bottom gets thick and woody, but these upper parts are still, you know, soft enough to prune really easily. And it requires shaping when it's young. If you don't shape it, it just goes straight up. The buckwheats we're finding out very low. Um, we're finding those are, these are planted along I-80 when you're headed to the Bay Area on those big cuts right after you go across the bridge at is it Car Carquinas Bridge. And um, they don't get any irrigation on those hills. And they're fine, they live, they've been there quite a while. Also a really great uh, plant for attracting butterflies. This is a little hair streak. Um, California fuchsia, I think many people have seen that already, blooms in the summer and fall. Great for hummingbirds. This plant comes in all shapes and sizes. It can be four feet tall, it can be six inches tall, it can have silver leaves like that one on the left, or it can have green leaves like that one on the right. Some of them are more invasive than others. You do not want to plant it in a, in a landscape that does get water because it will take over the world. You really want to put it where it's going to not get water once it's, or, or infrequent water once it's established. Uh, at the Arboretum, we have examples of a low water shade for using natives that, that we're going to be renovating this this winter and fixing it up a little bit more. We have examples for what to plant under native oaks if you have native oaks in your, uh, in your yard. And these are more on the once a month regime or not at all. There's a large native shrub, a calicanthus or spice bush. It gets very big. It's, it's 
doesn't need supplemental summer irrigation as long as it's in the shade and it has these cute flowers. It does go deciduous in the winter, so it loses its leaves. Um, the island arum root, which is a white coral bell, which doesn't really make sense. It should be the white bell. But um, it's a native one from Southern California. And these we grow under the oaks that we don't want to irrigate. We have interior live oaks in the collection. And we put that under there. And we just don't have any irrigation go near that tree ever under the drip line. And it does fine. His, this is that tree, the, the um, interior live oak. It's a really old, um, I think it's like from the 40s. So it's been 50 something years. And here's what this is used as a ground cover under there, that the Heuchera maxima. And then this is that evergreen versus deciduous thing I was talking about where you can create these layers. This one's evergreen. These are some sedges. This is a rush, uh, a juncus, which is evergreen. And then these get cut down uh, when they get brown. So you can layer. It's pretty easy if you use layering to make them look attractive. I showed you the rosada earlier uh, in another location here. It's growing just with, uh, in the native co collection. It does have, it's that maxima, the white one, with some hybridization from the Arizona red species, but it has maintained its drought tolerance. The red species really needs more water. It dies without a lot, without regular water, but these do really well. For under oaks, this is an evergreen ground cover sprawling plant. This one is also one I suggest for under redwood trees because it will take water or not water. It'll still be happy either way. And in the winter, it has tiny little maroon, purpley flowers all over it. It's like a little maroon mist, I call it. And although we emphasize natives, if you can use them, it's always good. There are other, lots of other compatible plants out there, things like Grevillea. We have a fairly good sized Australian plant collection if you like the more exotic. Um, and these are all super low water. Uh, we have a Mexican collection, also plants adapted to hot, dry summers. One of the most popular and predominant um, plants right now, we have about six or eight colors, I was out there today, um, is this um, uh, autumn sage. They bloom predominantly in the fall. They bloom in the spring, then they go out of bloom in the summer, and then they really bloom in the fall. They're very variable by cultivar on how um, long lived they are. So we're gonna be taking some of these ones and planting them out so we can see which ones are the most long lived. This Scots Red is my absolute favorite. Blooms early, full bloom in the spring, really attractive, attractive foliage. Um, and then again in the fall, really just blooms like crazy. I bought one today to put in my yard. Uh, Rus the Rosellia coral fountain is a Mexican species. And I mean, it's so dramatic and the hummingbirds just go crazy for it. It's a little more tender, so you gotta be careful, but you can create these masses of, of color and texture. Um, we have a very small South African section, but this is one of the plants that the researchers have been had looked at in the field trials out uh, south of the freeway. And um, Kerry Reed, the researcher who's the uh, horticulture advisor for San Joaquin County now, she found this one. I think she watered only had to water it once, and it still looked like it still looked really good. This thing's been super amazing. The nephophia or the poker, hot pokers, they do need some water. They don't bloom. But still could be in a low water landscape. All kinds of lavenders. Our favorite is this Goodwood Creek uh, Gray, which has been hedged over here. This is the Norton Simon Museum in LA. And I thought it was really interesting the way they used it, because this is a sculpture garden. They're featuring their sculptures. Um, Munstead, which is a more dwarf species. But there's lots of sizes to, to uh, to choose from, the, the ones that are on the all-star list are the toughest ones that seem really long-lived and they seem to do really well if you abuse them a little even. I have a personal thing about oreganos, that there's lots of beautiful ornamental oreganos. We don't carry that many, but there's a great nursery up um, at the foot of the Vaca Mountains, the Morning Sun Herb Farm, and they have a really good variety of oregano's if you, if, you get, if you really start to like them. And this just shows some of the variation. This is the all-star one that's a ground cover. The butterflies love this. This is a more upright one. Um, and so you can make these different uh, garden arrangements with them. 
That's just a close-up of the Betty Rollins. And they use it in the Honey Bee Haven garden, too, because it's really good for the bees and the butterflies. Here's one that I planted to droop over a wall in my front yard, the Lebanese oregano. A lot of people really like these, this they call it shell-like, and then the purple flowers that pop out the bottom. And this one was in a container, and the volunteers didn't like the way it looked because it gets beat up by the boron. This is boron burn. We have a lot of boron in our water. In the middle of the summer, they just whacked it to the ground. I was like, no. <laughs> and they whacked it to the ground, and I was like, oh my god, is it going to come back? And two weeks later, it was back in full bloom again. <laughs> so all that angst was for nothing. This is one that I, I've used. This is a hot south exposure with, we have really well-drained soils right on the banks in the Arboretum. So it's, the water's going to go through really fast. It's getting infrequent water. And there it is in the middle of the summer. I mean, it's just a really great plant. Hot exposure. Oops. The um, Flomus is really underused. And this, again, has those shish kebab flowers. And they can be either ground covers or shrubs. Um, it, it's, you don't see them very often, but they are really adaptable. It's native to the Mediterranean. And you can create um, you know, little nice little color groupings. It also comes in purple. This one is the all-star one. Uh, and they need shaping when they're young, but they're super. Um, we have these on the banks, too, in the Mediterranean section, where they just get fried, and they're fine. People don't realize culinary sage is also a good option for a low water garden. And then you can, when you're cooking your turkey at Thanksgiving, you're all set to go. <laughs> you got your sage leaves. And these are just, they come in different colors, the blue or white. This is a, a dwarf cultivar cultivar called Burgarten, which has much broader leaves and makes a really nice dome that I really like. It's a nice, I like things nice and round. Catmint, Nepeta, uh, here earlier spring, there a little bit later. This is right outside our nursery where we have these demonstration plantings of all, all the all-star, or as many of the all-stars as I could get when I put it in, plus we've been adding stuff now too. So if you want to see the all-stars, you can visit the nursery and just walk outside. There's no fences, um, no admission fee. And, and just walk along there and see if you see stuff that you like, because that's all going to be really good in low water. These are in back in the parking lot of um, where Whole Foods is. And they were really beautiful when they first went in. And then they've hired a new maintenance firm, firm that hasn't figured out you're supposed to leave those flowers on them. So what they do is they come and they cut them into little squares. And I'm always like, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the <clears throat> miscanthus, which is uh, Eulalia grass, which isn't a very good name. Um, it's, it's rated medium in Wuckles, but I have them in my backyard, and they get, low, they get really low water. They get some high shade from the trees, but right now, if you place them where the west sun, where you're standing when you're looking at them, the west sun is going down behind them, and they are just gorgeous. It's like these beautiful golden plumes sticking up. I really love them. That's just sort of a backlit, what it looks like. You could also use them in flower arrangements. We have lots of demonstration gardens. You've probably seen some of them. The uh, store garden is our oldest one. It was built in 1980. And lots of combinations of different kinds of low water plants that you can see. And this is fun. This is one bed that I focused on. And this is in the early springs, or in the mid springs. This is April. And see this chair here? And then this thing? OK, watch this. That's the fall. And I think that's a really good example of what you can do with low water plants. I mean, if you get really into it, you can just create these seasonal tableaus that these all go dormant in the summer. The bulbs will all be gone. And then the grasses pop up. And this is the California fuchsia. You know, and this is a Porovsky or one of those perennials that blooms in the fall. And so that you can have these really nice combinations. Yeah, we cut, we, um, the grasses get cut to the ground, and a lot of the perennials also get pruned down. So this is like higher maintenance than some people might want, because this is complicated with you know, crazy professional plant nerds working on it. But um, you could take some of the elements of these and maybe only use two species, and then use a lawnmower and just run the lawnmower over them. 
Sounds harsh, I know. Um, this the terrace garden next to Whole Foods is really a problem. The back, they used it as the parking for all the, um, the construction trucks when they were building that building. And so the soil compaction was so bad that when we tried to poke holes in it to plant, um, the auger, I had like a 10 inch, 12 inch auger on the back of a tractor, it wouldn't even go into the soil. I was like, uh oh. So we brought in a bunch of soil on the top, built it up, made mounds so we could plant it. And so now I like to think the roots have managed to break up some of that hard pan down there. But so along that wall there is a good place to look for things that don't, um, that tolerate saturated soil. These are the raised plantings that we put in so people who come to the nursery can see what their plants that they're thinking of buying are going to look like. This is the same bed. Again, this is in the spring. Over here, the purples and lavenders, and there's the nepeta and a toy on, and then this is in the fall. So you can see how it really switches. And these are pictures I've taken out there on those demonstration beds with the beautiful Ackman blue on the pink buckwheat and the hummingbird, um, the Allen's hummingbird on the salvia, um, hummingbird sage, aptly named. And then we've done more beds outside and all around the nursery, which I think are worth a look and see what you like, you know, before you think about what you want to buy and, and then maybe visit it, you know, more than just one time because this bed tends to be super showy in the fall. This is the same bed, but, um, and then in the winter it's down, you know what I mean? We, we cut it all down and then, so it doesn't look as showy then, but it's beautiful this time of year. We've even taken some of these plants and we're taking our horticulture experiments to another level by putting them in the road medians over on campus. And uh, they're doing pretty well. It turned out some areas weren't succeeding and that the water, somebody turned it off. So I got no water this summer. So that's actually a really interesting place to go and look at what lived through that, you know, and what actually survives. Um, everything is a learning opportunity. This is the California fuchsia. It's a cultivar called Bowman's number one. And these are little uh, Budalua, which is a native grass. They call it eyelash grass or eyebrow grass. It has these really attractive floral, um, uh, they look like toothbrushes. And then these are some of the ones that survived where the water got turned off. These are des this is a desert plant, Dazzlerion, super dramatic and very sculptural. I mean, amazing looking. And then I just like, I don't like agaves because they always stick me with their sharp tips. But that one, I really like the form because it kind of comes up and then relaxes a little. And then with the variegations, um, I think it's really pretty. Plus we go out and we dig up all these babies and put them in pots and sell them to people. <laughs> so all the money from our plant sales goes for educational programming. So it really is a fundraising function of the friends group, which is our support group. So we hope you'll come visit. We hope you'll take advantage of all the handouts back there. Um, and there's the website. On the website is also templates. I guess I didn't put the templates, but there's like templates of real world things that were built. You can take the template and go out there and look and see what it looks like. And then there's some templates that are just sort of made up that you could say, oh, that would be nice to do, you know, all, all the aid of garden or, or whatever. Um, we have lots of grassy areas. If you like ornamental grasses, you can go look at those. And then I'll put in your new drought tolerant yard. <laughs> and the thing is, right, when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. Aldo Leopold. And this is a, this is, is that a bee or a fly? Yes. And look, he's hunting the aphid. <laughs> Our digital camera's great, you know. So I'll be at the plant sale if you have any questions on Saturday, and Don will be there also. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>